Hello from the Financial Times in London and welcome to this digital event, which we're delighted to be hosting in partnership with the Lloyd's Register Foundation. We're here to discuss a subject, a living organism that's arguably been overlooked by the world for too long, and that is seaweed or marine algae. Now, it's not a central part of most people's lives at the moment. It's not something they spend much time thinking about, uh, unless perhaps they're lucky enough to live by the coast or, or take a holiday there. And if they think about it at all, people may think it's slimy or, or, or vaguely smelly. But today we're gonna to be talking about the case for changing that because today marks the launch of a new group called the Safe Seaweed Coalition. Now this coalition reflects the growing number of people who argue that seaweed should not just be left in the sea and that it may in fact be our greatest untapped resource, that it's edible, that all of us can and should be eating it and that doing so could help us solve some of the gravest problems facing humanity from poverty and food insecurity to climate change. That's what the Safe Seaweed Coalition is all about. And later we'll have a panel discussion with several members of the coalition's steering committee. Before that, I'm gonna be talking to Vincent Dumézel of the Lloyd's Register Foundation, who's a co-leader of the coalition and the lead writer of a seaweed manifesto that was launched last year and contained a call to scale up the seaweed industry. First though, a couple of things to tell you in the audience. We'd like to encourage you to ask questions at any time via the Q&A box on the right side of your screen. You can start sending them in as soon as you like and we'll answer as many as we can in the final 10 minutes of the panel discussion. You can also share your thoughts and tweets on social media. Please use the hashtag Seaweed Revolution. So now over to uh, Vincent Dumézel. Vincent, thank you very much for joining us today. You're director for the food program at the Lloyd's Register Foundation. You're a senior advisor at the United Nations Global Compact, and you're also a member of a panel advising the European Commission on the subject that we're talking about today, which is seaweed. So let's, let's get to it. Could you start off by giving us your, your perspective, please, on how seaweed is misunderstood uh, and why we need a revolution in the way the world thinks about and uses it. Yeah, well, uh, thanks a lot, Barney. Uh, yeah, you, you named it. I mean, seaweed is seen as slimy, smelly, and unsexy, and, and it really, really, it's time to get over it. Uh, and we all add a lot of seaweed today. Seaweed, uh, is, uh, there's a lot of product that contains seaweed, and we had a lot of them today. It's very different in Asia, where they are eating seaweed as such every day, and, and they have quite clear benefit from that in terms of health and, and longevity and so forth. They are living longer in good health and so forth. And seaweed farming has doubled uh, in Asia over the last 10 years, which is quite impressive. Seaweed remains very, very unknown. Uh, and and see, referring to seaweed as such may be a mistake. And in Asia, they call that sea vegetables. And I think that's, that's a good way to name them. I mean, there are more than weeds, there are vegetables. They are, they are the right diversity of seaweed in the world, and, and uh, they have two billion years of existence. Some of the green seaweed moved on land and gave birth to all the vegetal you see around this, around us. So just to, for you to understand what, what is the diversity of seaweed, I mean, if you take green seaweed, they will be closer to an oak tree or to a strawberry than to a brown seaweed. The genetic difference between a brown seaweed and a green seaweed will be equivalent to the difference, or will be bigger even, and a difference between a fungi and a mammal. Um, so that's quite big. Uh, as for the revolution, uh, I think the, the, the world revolution initially came from journalists. Uh, well, uh, I initially, uh, so it was a bit arrogant as a word, and so I'm French uh, can manage it, but <laughs> so, but in the end, maybe he was right. Maybe we need a revolution. Uh, maybe we need a civil revolution, and maybe that's the right terminology. Uh, we need a revolution because we have a very immature relationship with the ocean. We are just dumping our waste and picking resources there without any concern on the, about the ocean ecosystem. So 10,000 years ago, we moved out of prehistory when we start, stopped being hunters, gatherers and, and, and became farmers uh, uh, on land. But we never did that for the ocean. We are still in the stone age in the ocean. We are once again uh, disrupting the ecosystem, leading the species, fish and, and seaweed to extinction because we just collect them and grab them opportunistically without any concern. And that's a big problem. And, and I, I, if we want to build ecosystem at sea instead of breaking them, I think seaweed is an excellent place to start. 
So uh, seaweed is just amazing. So you would argue there is aquaculture already, but aquaculture is only mostly far farming animal today, which is quite crazy when you think about it. When we moved to farming on land, we start uh, farming crops, and then we gave these crops to the to the animals, and we start start breeding. But but in the ocean, we are only growing animals. So I mean, we need solutions to feed them. Seaweed is a solution. I mean, you don't need land, you don't need feed, you don't need fresh water, you don't need pesticides. It grows very very fast, and it's not going to run away or swim away or fly away. That's why it's very very good. And I think that's a very, very good news for everyone. I mean, they have the level of optimism there, which is very high. The timing is right. The momentum is here. We, have a, 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 we are in, in the process to build a really regenerative system that could protect our life and uh, our planet. So there's a treasure in the ocean. Uh, so we, we can really, and I think what's really revolutionary here is that people can lead the change. I mean, four times a day, we are all environmental activists. Each time we eat and we drink or we purchase something, we lead the change. So, so let's do it. Let's let's go for seaweed-based product. Uh, seaweed has so much potential to uh, mitigate, as you say, uh, world hunger, malnutrition, uh, pollution, biodiversity loss, poverty, climate change. So it's time. Let's ask for the change and and let's do it. We need to ask for a change, otherwise the, the change will never happen. And and that's why we did this manifesto and all this story about seaweed. Thank you, Vincent. So let me put a statistic out there. According to the Food and Agriculture Organization, the proportion of total human protein consumption that comes from seaweed is just 0.18%. That's a, a tiny number. So there's clearly a lot of room to grow. As you've alluded to, most of that consumption now happens in a few countries in East Asia, in Japan, South Korea, and China. In the rest of the world, there's almost nothing at all. So what is your coalition, what is the Safe Seaweed Coalition going to do to try and encourage more people around the world to eat seaweed? Well, I think first, I mean, besides the coalition, we need to raise awareness. We need to raise awareness around this upscale, responsible and restorative uh, uh, new industry. So we are the first generation to know um, that our food system have, have some major issues, an unprecedented challenge to feed the world of tomorrow. So we know that food security is going to be a big concern. We know that our food system are, are the main contributor to, uh, to global, are one of the main contributors to global warming, to uh, malnutrition. We know that one child out of four is uh, suffering from, is stunted due to malnutrition. We know that one billion people are starving today. And uh, we know that the, the the, the, I mean, the glo global warming will be a big, big concern. There's more and more biodiversity loss, plastic pollution. So here we have, and we know that there's a wealth concentration in the world that is a time bomb, a shame, and a time bomb for all of us, I think. So, and we know that seaweed can, can be a, so, a, a solution for that as a source of food, as you mentioned. I mean, the ocean covers 70% of the planet and, and only contribute to 3% of our food and calories. How come one billion people are starving while we only use one third of our planet? So I think the initial objective was really about trying to create a solution, I mean, uh, raise awareness about that solution. I mean, and seaweed is not only food. I mean, it can be feed, it can be animal feed. So there's a lot of uh, very good benefit out of it. It can be fertilizers. It can be bioplastic. Today I have, I have this, 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 this glass, which is made out of seaweed and I can eat it after, at the end if I can, if I want. So it's a, it's a seaweed, uh, the glass is made of seaweed, so it's much better than plastic. It can replace plastic and cut plastic pollution. It can restore biodiversity. It can sequester a lot of carbon. Uh, seaweed can grow up to 30 centimeters a day, up to 60 meters high uh, for some seaweed. So that sequester a lot of carbon and that's the food that can reverse climate change. Not only because that, that, that will be more than positive in terms of production. And ultimately, once again, it can create revenues and jobs uh, for, for, uh, for coastal communities, notably in emerging countries where we need to support people. And incident, I mean, it happens also to, to benefit to another of our big concern, which is uh, women empowerment and, and, and gender equity, because we realize that uh, in the emerging uh, world, seaweed is also contributing to women empowerment because most of the seaweed workers are women. So that gives them revenues which is very positive for our planet, I think. Right, right. So just to, just to come back to the point about climate change, you're arguing that if the world were to eat more 
seaweed, it would reduce carbon emissions from traditional agriculture. Is that the, that the idea? No, well, not only that, but seaweed will, I mean, the good thing with seaweed, uh, and seaweed, and that's a, a big uh, debate, uh, is that it, it take, it, 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 through the photosynthesis, photosynthesis, it will uh, take carbon from the atmosphere. I mean, that's the only uh, vegetable that can really massively take carbon. But, but per square meter, it, 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 uh, it sequesters much more carbon than any other primary uh, forest on, on land. So you can get a lot of, uh, of, of, uh, of carbon sequestration on seaweed, and then seaweed may sometimes sink in, in the ocean, and then it's out of the carbon cycle. So you really, so you can cool down the atmosphere. I mean, uh, Tim Flannery uh, said some years ago that with 9% of the ocean dedicated to seaweed production, you would uh, start to cool down the atmosphere because it will absorb more and more carbon that we emit on the planet. That say we have to be very cautious, uh, very cautious on this. We have to be very cautious because uh, we don't know exactly what will be the impact on the ecosystem of so much seaweed, so much carbon on the seabed. So there's a lot of discussion around this. There's a big potential, but there's a big risk as well. Ocean is contributing to 50% of at least of the ocean, uh, of the oxygen we breathe. So we need to be very careful and not to disrupt this ecosystem and make sure that once again everything we do in the ocean is promoting life underwater. Let's talk a little bit about seaweed production at the moment. As we've discussed, there are already some markets for seaweed in Asia. Where is seaweed produced now and what does that production process look like? Well, seaweed is 99% is, is, uh, of seaweed production uh, is in Asia, basically almost. Uh, and seaweed is only farmed in Asia. Uh, the rest of the world is not farming seaweed, it's collecting seaweed. And then we have a big problem uh, to address the market, which is, uh, to come back to your question, because I yeah, not formally answer it, which is the objective of our coalition is to open the market for the rest of the world and contribute to open the market. And the coalition, the Safe Seaweed Coalition, it does not mean that we are launching today. Uh, it does not mean that, that seaweed is unsafe, and, and at the contrary, it's not unsafe. The Safe Seaweed Coalition has a, 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 an objective to create a global market on seaweed and to open up the market. And if you go to the likes of Nestle and Danone and, and Cargill, the big brands, the big food brands, the big thing what they will tell you is that there's no global standards for seaweed. There's no international regulation that is recognized by everyone, which is a big, big deal. I mean, if we take a very, very simple problem like iodine, uh, iodine level in France, in, in Europe, and in the US, the tolerance is very low, uh, which prevent a lot of product to access the market in, in Europe and in the US. In Asia, where seaweed is already produced and, manuf and, and, and manufactured extensively, and they have, they have seaweed every day and every meal, in this part of the world, uh, the tolerance for iodine is 100 times higher than in Europe and US. So that does not make sense. And the, and, and the explanation for this is just ignorance and, and overprotection. So we define very low level just to make sure that there's no problem. But there's no problem. It's good for us and so forth. So we need. We need to harmonize all of this, which is the basic objective of the Safe Seaweed Coalition. So we want to harmonize this uh, uh, global market. We want also to, to create a, a standard for the environment, not only for the food and the feed and the product, but, but we want to create standards for the environment to ease the licensing, to ease the social licensing and also the permitting from local authorities. People are still quite scared, and is that a misunderstood that you were talking about? People are scared about seaweed production because they think that seaweed will be uh, really a source of negative impact uh, on the, will have a negative impact on the environment, which is not true. But we have to demonstrate that we have to aggregate the research, we have to build standards and regulation to make sure that yes, it is done safely. And the last point that the coalition wants to address uh, is the, the lack of uh, operational, occupational safety. I mean, we need to establish some very stringent um, uh, occupational safety standards. We are talking about workers in the emerging countries that cannot swim. We are talking about them working in shallow water or in offshore. So we need to make sure that they are safe. With this coalition, we will be able to drive investment, to drive collaboration, because that's the other big, big problem. Uh, collaboration is missing, notably outside of Asia. We have no collaboration. We have brave pioneers who already made great, great things with seaweed. Really, really courageous people. But, but they are alone, they are, they are working in isolation. We do not share experience. So this coalition has an objective to share experience. Do that 
will release today a portal, uh, a specific website with a portal where we can map the market, where we can view all the stakeholders, which could drive in, you know, uh, innovation and which could drive investment so that people can, can come to us and ask, uh, I mean, uh, it, it, can, it should drive visibility for the investor because there's a lot of impact investors who want to work with CV, but they don't know where to start and we need investment. So basically safety, is the most, uh, either, uh, has a strong convening power, and we need uh, a collaboration in this, in this industry if we want to, scale up, to, to, to really scale up. It will be a membership led uh, organization, so we want to go through a, collab a consultation process with our members over the next uh, two months. We will have roundtable discussion with our members by group of 15 or 10 to 15. We will have this collaborative portal called the Greenhouse, where we will grow this, this seaweed community and share uh, information. Uh, the membership will be free because the Lloyd's Reducer Foundation based in London, a charity based in London is funding a, a multi-million grant to really enable that coalition to kick off and to start and to create that global community. We'll have a session on April 1st to speak with our members and, and, to, and to tell them how it will work and, the, and, and all the details. And then mostly this coalition will support project and 80% of the, of the money that was granted by Lloyd's will go to support projects that could improve safety for the product, for the environment, or for the people. That's what is our objective with the coalition. And any members working in the seaweed industry is really welcome and can uh, register online on our website, which is live today, save seaweed, safe seaweedcoalition.org. Let's dig into this question of, of safety where seaweed is produced, both occupational safety, which you mentioned, and environmental safety. I think two of the biggest producers in Asia are the Philippines and Indonesia. Tell us a little bit about what that production looks like. Is this run by companies or organizations? Is it individuals taking seaweed from the sea? No, that's cultivation there. I mean, you have two markets in Asia. One, one in the North Asia, which is really where I would say we want to go, all of us, which is about seaweed as a source of food. People really have seaweed as a source of food in North Asia, China, uh, Korea, and Japan. And seaweed are making, they, are, they have a huge tradition around seaweed cultivation, and they know how to cook and to eat seaweed. In the South Asia, we are more using seaweed as a texturing agent, what we call a, a hydrocolloid, which is a type of seaweed that you have every day in your toothpaste, in your ice cream, in your desserts, which is used extensively by the food industry, uh, which is quite a, 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 a commodity market at the moment. So we need to we need to move away from that and, 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 and make sure we optimize uh, the use of seaweed. So these seaweeds that are grown in, 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 in South Asia and are used only to do carginan, to do texture reagent, they should be used to do many other things. They should be used to, uh, to create nutrients, to create a source of bioplastics like this. We can do many things. We, can, we should have some kind of biorefineries for seaweed so that we can extract the good content of it, the good compounds and, and valorize them all. So I think the, 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 the North Asia market is very mature. The North Asia production is very mature, not to be mean, but and the South Asia market, which is much, which is quite new. In fact, it's uh, only 30, 40 years ago, uh, which has been driven by uh, Euro European or US companies for this production of hydrocolloid, still has to uh, develop. And, and, and there's a lot of research and a lot of investment to be made. We need to make, make their culture much more resilient to uh, climate change, to ocean acidification, because that's a big problem for them at the moment. And we need to understand the complexity of sea. Once again, talking about such a, a diversity of organisms, it's very, very hard to understand the, the full complexity of them. And, 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 and th there's a problem with safety standards there as well, but I think mostly the problem with safety standards is in Europe and, 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 and US, where we are, once again, quite immature in Africa as well, where seaweed has a, has a great, great potential, I think as a source of, of food. So we need, in terms of safety standards, seaweed is not unsafe as such. I mean, it's safe. We just need to make sure that the, 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 the regulation makes sense everywhere and that we aggregate uh, research and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and knowledge about seaweed. That's what we need to do, because it's all there. It's all there, but it's just scattered all around the world. And, and we have decided, and that's why it's so important to have UN Global Compact supporting so, so actively this, this initiative uh, with Lloyd's Register Foundation, with the CNRS in France, and with all these stakeholders from the steering committees, the FAO, the WWF, and, 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 and all the representatives from the various countries, we need to have them uh, with us to improve this 
global standards to improve collaborations and, and to really drive visibility and investment for research and entrepreneurship in this civil world. So let's talk a little bit more about the role of government. Obviously, it's governments that are going to make decisions on standards and regulations, uh, as you've been referring to. What indications do you have that governments outside Asia are interested in this subject? How are you going to persuade them to get interested? Well, I think, yeah, a lot of governments are getting uh, more and more interested and, 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 and our panelists will detail this for their respective countries. But we see a growing interest from EU to harmonize standards in Asia. The FAO, uh, after the release of the manifesto and our presentation to the UN General Assembly, uh, about this manifesto decided to uh, create, uh, to register a single CV standard at Codex Alimentarius. And uh, maybe Johnny will detail that, but that's a great step forward for us because there will be an international regulation on seaweed. That will help a lot. So EU is working on it. We know that the US are working on it. We know that Australia is working on it. So once again, we bring all these people together in the coalition and, and know we should work cross country because seaweed is not, I mean, there's no frontier in the ocean. There's nothing that can prevent, prevent a seaweed to move from a country to another, which is a big concern. So we need to have globalized uh, regulation. We need these countries to work together. And we've seen also that a lot of uh, research and, and, and demonstrators that were funded by countries or regions were a bit uh, overlapping with other initiatives in other countries. So once again, we need to make sure that we are uh, very efficient in terms of research and, and, um, and, and, and investment. Yeah. Now, another essential element of this is going to be money investment. You mentioned it, impact investors earlier. Where do you think the funding for some of this work on developing the industry will come from? I think it comes from, first of all, at the end of the day, seaweed is not very expensive to grow. I mean, there is some initial uh, investment, when, more, mostly for research and to understand and to catch up these 10,000 years that we are late, 10,000 years versus land production, so we have to catch up. And we don't have 10,000 years in front of us if we want to address this global challenge. So I think that this investment should go from investors, should come from, should come from investors, private and public investment. I think there's a lot of public investment because once again, it, 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 at the end of the day, it's, it's for the benefit of, to everyone. And it, it will support uh, most of the global challenges that our generation is facing. So a lot of people are interested right now to invest and we receive call every week uh, to understand where to invest, what to do. But these investors, they are lacking visibility at the moment. They are lacking visibility, collaboration and convergence. So there are so many different views. Some wants to, do, to grow seaweed for, to replace plastic as a source of food, as a source of feed, uh, in order to, to sink it, uh, to, to, to sequester carbon. We need convergence, we need a real global strategy, we need countries to work together and to fund it together. And I think investment will be absolutely obvious in, into that, and, and, and the long-term investment will pay back, for sure. But do you mean investors such as private equity groups, uh, venture sure. capital, corporations? Yeah. Yes, yeah, there is a lot of them. I mean, we need R&D investment from large, large, large brands, large food brands. They need to do R&D investment. I mean, the likes uh, of Nestle, Danone and Cargill, they have interest in seaweed for, as a source of vegan meal, uh, as a source of bio packaging, as a source of feed uh, for their supply chain to cut uh, methane emission and so on, to cut uh, antibiotics and so forth. So they have interest. They need to go for R&D. We need private investors. We need uh, hedge funds. We need, we need private equities. To invest and once again there's a growing demand on that we need banks to invest uh we need the, the government to invest so it will come but we th that's already happening i mean there's a lot of things going at the moment once again the only thing is that it's there's a problem of con of, of collaboration once again and, and and transparency in this investment so we should drive this with the, and with the coalition we will be in a position to do so and we will provide the tools uh to do so Obviously, anyone who's, who's ever eaten in a, in a Japanese restaurant will have probably come across seaweed wrapped around their sushi rolls or, or in their miso soup. But is this revolution about primarily about expanding the use of seaweed as a food like that? Or could it be more about these invisible uses of seaweed that you've referred to as an ingredient in other products? It will be obviously both, but we've seen from experience that a very uh, sustainable uh, development of the seaweed industry means seaweed as a source of direct food. Uh, so we need seaweed as a source of direct food to increase the, vo the volume and to increase the production. We need, 
we need people, we need you all here <laughs> to eat seaweed, to start getting into it uh, in order to drive the change. I mean, if we only rely on other use of seaweed, of course, you have some very high value added market in cos cosmetics or in medicines. I mean, medicine is something that we have not mentioned, but there's high potential to explore there uh, as well as textile. But so it's good because it creates resilience for, the, uh, for this industry. But we have to explore all potentials, but where is the drivers? And at least that's what we've realized with this experience, with the experience we have in North Asia. The real driver or the real enabler is food production. We need, uh, we need food production if we want to drive innovations and, and, and diversification in terms of the seaweed application. Um, Vansor, let me ask about the UN Sustainable Development Goals. How does the work you're doing here with seaweed relate to the the SDGs, which of course uh, we're hoping will be met in 2030. Well, they relate a lot. I mean, a lot of the SDGs are, um, and seaweed applications are meeting a lot of the SDGs. Once again, world hunger, poverty reduction, uh, gen uh, gender parity, life below water, uh, and so forth, so biodiversity restoration. All of, all of these SDGs, I mean, seaweed play a key role in, in global warming and pollution, of course. So seaweed play a key role there. That's why it's so important for the United Nations to, uh, to, to promote this use of seaweed and to promote that, that evolution of our planet. And, uh, and, and, and we, we, we see a lot of enthusiasm really, really around that. Thank you, Vincent. We've got just a, a few minutes left. So let me, let me ask a final question, which is what does success look like for your coalition? What will a good outcome be? Well, that's a good question, thank you. Uh, well, indeed, success for our coalition, it's not only for our coalition, success uh, can only be collective. So it will be for, for all of us. It will be a success for seaweed, mostly for, for the ocean, and as a consequence for our civilization, I think. Once again, we are facing unprecedented challenges, but we benefit from unprecedented capacities for innovation. And it's all about us and our decision. And I think we, we have to dream big here. Success is to look at ourselves in 20 years, 20 years time and, and, and be able to think that we did the right thing. We did the right thing. And I don't know what is the right thing, but I, I do believe that a big part of it is lying under uh, the ocean. And, and, and once again, um, our actions on seaweed so far and all these people coming to us with a, a lot of optimism, that, that's, that's how we will change it. And, and of course, in order to leverage uh, on the full potential of seaweed, we will face skepticism and possibly critics. We will, have, we will have to face the interest of all these legacy industries. But I think if we work collectively and believe in ourselves, success can, can be really, really important. And, and I'm, I'm not scared. I think we, we also, more importantly, we have to face some uh, technological and economical barriers that you mentioned. But I'm also optimistic. And if you look at what happened over the last month to all of us, I mean, uh, some key takeaways that we can take is that we can do things that are, that are deemed impossible by many people. I mean, we were all told uh, that a vaccine would take, for the virus, would take 10 years to get developed. And because we have all this computing power, this collective intelligence, sharing knowledge, uh, huge big data, we created a vaccine, or five, in, in nine months. So that's, that's quite impressive. And, with regard to the economic aspect, I mean, success uh, and, and the success aspect, I think the last months and this, this, uh, this experience also uh, made obvious uh, with all this public money spent to support our life, our communities, our job. It made obvious that the ultimate objective of a modern economy can only be more social justice. And it can only be to improve safety for our people and for our planet. And macroalgae and seaweed, they have a role to play here it can help a better distribution of wealth. So it will be a complicated and very long blue road, but all together we are heading to the right direction and seaweed will be a bigger part of our life. I think farming seaweed is, is a natural-based solution. It's a, it's a global solution. It's a game-changing solution. It's a revolution. Great, Vincent, thank you so much. Our, our time is up. Uh, you've really helped us to understand why people should care about seaweed. And that's a very important reminder about how the pandemic has accelerated change for good and, and bad. Um, we're now gonna dig deeper into some of the, the issues you've raised with our panel. So let me introduce them. Uh, first, we're gonna be joined by Philippe Potin, who is a senior research scientist and marine biologist at CNRS, which is the French National Center for scientific research. He's also a co-leader 
of the Safe Seaweed Coalition. Uh, we're joined from Tanzania by Flawa Masuya, who is a senior researcher and seaweed farming expert at the University of Dar es Salaam. Uh, from South Korea, we're joined by Professor Gwang Hoon Kim, who is a cell biologist and president of the Piropia Aquaculture Research Coalition. Uh, from Connecticut in the United States, we're joined by Anushka Concepcion, who is an extension educator with the Connecticut Sea Grant program. She works on assisting seaweed producers and others with commercializing aquaculture. And finally, uh, we're joined by Jun Ning Tsai, who is an economist and aquaculture officer at the UN Food and Agriculture Organization. So thank you all, welcome. Uh, you're all, of course, as I mentioned at the start, members of the, uh, the Coalition Steering Committee. So we're glad to have you with us. Um, Philippe, I'm gonna start with, with you. Um, tell us a little more about what safe seaweed cultivation looks like. Uh, Vincent's talked a lot about the safety issue. So tell us what, what safe cultivation looks like and, and how this can actually help oceanic ecosystems. Yeah, thank you, uh, Barney, for, for this question. Uh, it's very important. And uh, we have to say that uh, uh, we have many examples of uh, cultivation which is do do done very safe in the world at the moment, uh, including in Asia, in Southeast Asia and Africa. And we have uh, many examples of uh, very good practices. And uh, we have to share these good practices. And it will be the most important to stress uh, at the beginning. And uh, what we, are, we want to do, achieve with uh, the with, uh, the, the coalition is uh, really to make this uh, cultivation more safer, safer for, for the future. And especially uh, in the areas where it will develop, uh, in new areas where it will develop. And um, we have to really consider different points of attention. Of course, we have to ensure that uh, seaweed cultivation will be done in a safe place, uh, which will be a, a, we are um, exempted of um, many pollutants. Uh, we have to uh, prevent uh, the accumulation of pollutants by seaweeds, except if we are cultivating for bioremediation, because, because it's also an aspect of uh, the benefits of uh, seaweed cultivation. But if we are cultivating for food, we have to, to be in an area which, which will be suitable for the seaweed, we will provide enough nutrients to grow uh, well the seaweeds. And this is uh, the type of space you, you can see in uh, many areas where it is cultivated. Another important point is also to ensure biosecurity for the producers. So we have to secure the provide the provision of uh, seeding for for the for, for, for the producers, and these uh, seedings could uh, of course be adapted to the environment, and they could uh, have very good physio physiological performances, but also be prevent uh, uh, be um, uh, avoid any type of uh, diseases which could occur during the cultivation. Uh, in many areas uh, of the world uh, at the moment, the, we are facing some uh, problem with um, uh, diseases in seaweeds cultivation, and uh, that could be prevented by uh, working on preventing the, um, the, the lack of genetic diversity in the, in the, the provision of seeding. So that this is a, a very important work, uh, work, which is of course very science-based at the beginning, but, uh, but also involves the producers to select the, the, the best um, uh, varieties which will be adapted and will be uh, resistant and tolerant to different stresses. So this is very important and that will help uh, the, the producers to, uh, to be successful in, the, in developing a safe cultivation. It's uh, very important. It, we have also some scientific principles which will be probably applied for any new types of um, uh, cultivation development will be to prevent the introduction of alien species because introducing alien species for cultivation may also introduce uh, uh, other species, it may introduce uh, some parasites. So we have to be very careful and that will uh, be very important for, for the, 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 the development of uh, civic cultivation in the future. Another important point is also the, to prevent any conflict of uh, interest uh, with um, uh, competition for space when you are developing cultivation. So that also should be anticipate, um, anticipated. And uh, it, that will also provide a lot of safety, uh, preventing any conflicts, which could be in fact, uh, sometimes uh, quite dangerous for, for producers. And the last point I will stress is um, we have to start by dem uh, having demonstration sites and upscaling progressively uh, in any new areas that we will learn from, the, the, of course, what was done during the, the, the recent decades in terms of civic cultivation. There, there is so many progress, uh, Vincent was stressed, 
uh, stressing the, 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 the growth of the, this industry. It's, it's, it's now becoming the uh, half of the, 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 the volume of uh, mariculture production in the world. So series are very important. But uh, we have to uh, start a new uh, operation with, uh, with caution. And then it, it will uh, help to, to, to start. Uh, it will, will uh, answer to you the second part of your questions. How we can recover from the degradation? In many areas in the world, seaweeds are uh, uh, natural populations and, uh, and forests are declining, it's, um, mainly from the impact of climate change, but not only. Uh, it could be also uh, some urban pollutions or some uh, mining pollutions, which are uh, damaging some uh, natural uh, seaweed forests. So in some uh, areas, it will, it will probably become impossible to restore uh, the pristine uh, state of the, the natural forest. And we have to consider that uh, seaweed cultivation may provide what we call, uh, in, uh, as a scientist, ecosystem services, or so services which will um, uh, replace the natural forest. Thanks, Philippe. Let me just ask a little more about the cultivation process to help our audience understand. Is this simply a matter of fishing naturally occurring seaweed out of the ocean, or does cultivation involve creating bordered areas where seaweed is cultivated artificially? Yeah, the, the development of the cultivation, uh, as it was done in Asia and other uh, um, regions of the world, it was, uh, of course, artificially done. It was, uh, even if we can have some uh, management of natural population, and that could be an option, especially in terms of restoration. But uh, when we are talking about developing a, a, an industry for to provide food, we have to consider and to, 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 to develop an efficient cultivation. And that is based on the development of uh, some uh, efficient hatcheries, which we are providing the seeding material for, for establishing culture, which will be mainly uh, developed at, uh, in open sea, but which could also, so in some places, be uh, located in land-based systems. So we have a very efficient cultivation, which is operated at the moment in uh, cultivation ponds, which are close, for, close by, for example, other type of aquaculture, like uh, shrimp uh, farming, or and which are providing additional services in, in addition to providing food. Okay, thank you, Philippe. Uh, Flower, let, let's turn to you. Um, welcome to the discussion. Now, among your many roles, you're also chairperson of the Zanzibar Seaweed Cluster Initiative on the, uh, on the wonderful island of Zanzibar in Tanzania. Tell us a little bit about what seaweed cultivation looks like there, how's it organized, and what are the big challenges? Uh, thank you very much, Barney. Uh, in Tanzania, actually, the seaweed is produced by mostly women who are more than 80% of, of the, the farmers. There are some few men who are also uh, working on seaweed, but it, it is mostly uh, produced by, by women. And uh, we see mostly uh, we have uh, uh, individuals, that the, the farms that are owned by, by individuals. And uh, there are also uh, uh, family-owned farms, farms that are owned by, by families. Uh, in the setup, you see that uh, group farming is not common. It is quite difficult. It was tried in the past, but it didn't work. So uh, the farmers usually would farm uh, as groups of, or cooperatives only when they want to use the seaweed for, for value addition to make seaweed products. Otherwise, you find everywhere they are individual farms or family farms. And then uh, we, we see that uh, these, uh, these farmers actually farm the seaweed harvest it, dry it, and then they sell to business companies that export, export the seaweed to USA, Denmark, France, and, and the other, other places. So uh, we, we see that uh, these, these women are actually working hard, the farmers are working hard, and, uh, and really seaweed farming is a activity. So they, 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 they farm the seaweed, but uh, we see also that there's a challenge of a low price of the seaweed. And uh, the, the farmers feel that uh, what they are producing actually, what they are working on, the effort put there uh, is not uh, paid enough uh, with, with this uh, low price. Uh, and also when, when we look, we see uh, that uh, the challenge of, of uh, climate change, which is uh, uh, raising the, the increasing the, the, the seawater temperature. Uh, and this uh, increase in seawater temperature, climate change is causing 
uh, diseases in the in the seaweed farms. All kind of diseases, like I said, we have epiphytes, we have uh, some blooms happening. So all this uh, causing actually uh, the, the decrease in seaweed production. And over the years, we have seen the seaweed actually actually decreasing, and the farmers' income decreasing, meaning also that the livelihoods of the farmers is affected. So this what economic activity for, for the farmers is now being affected by all these kind of challenges. Otherwise, that's how, how it is produced and, and marketed uh, mainly in Tanzania. We've talked a little bit about occupational safety already. How dangerous is this work for the farmers involved? Uh, seaweed farming, uh, especially in the, in, the, in, the, in the water there, um, we can't say that it's too dangerous, but uh, there are some risks, there are uh, some uh, um, uh, issues that can happen. For example, when the, the, the farmers are in the, in the water, for example, women, you know, they walk, they walk to the farms, they move around the farms, they can actually uh, step on sharp shells that can cut them. They can uh, be stung by uh, organisms such as sea urchins. They are even more dangerous ones, like uh, not poisonous, not very poisonous, but uh, like rayfish and the, and the stony fish. These, these farmers, these women are stung by, by, by this kind of, of, of organisms. They can be indoors for up to three months without going to the farms because of, because of, of this. And now we, we, are, we are seeing that because of uh, uh, effect of climate change, we are actually uh, seeing the farmers, uh, we are training the farmers and we are seeing them uh, doing it, moving farms into deep waters. Now, when you go to deeper waters now, there are challenges, there are risks uh, associated with farmers, especially the women. Women cannot swim. Uh, women do not own boats. They don't have life jackets. They don't have all this kind of uh, protective gear that they could use in, in, the, uh, in the deep waters to, to, to farm the seaweed. So there are some challenges actually that are really faced by, by these farmers when they're producing the seaweed. So a big theme of our discussion today is scaling up production. In Tanzania, what would need to happen to enable a big scaling up of seaweed production, do you think? Uh, for, for, for scaling up the seaweed production, actually, uh, we, I would say that uh, we should actually uh, stop farming in the shallow water. In, in these two shallow waters where the seaweed is exposed directly to, to uh, sunlight, uh, hot temperatures, is actually causing the decrease in, sea, in, in production. So what we need is to, to go into deeper waters. And in, into deeper waters, then we need to actually uh, uh, help. You know, we, we need all these kind of uh, maybe uh, swimming lessons for women to help them work in the deep waters. We need all kind of uh, equipment such as uh, boats to go there. We need um, protective gear, life jackets, proper shoes. Even when they are they are walking uh, around, they need these proper shoes for for, uh, for farming. So I think that uh, we, if we are to increase production, we need to really develop technologies that can be used in the deeper waters, the sea within the deeper waters, because in the deeper waters, um, the, the conditions are uh, more optimal. Than in the shallow waters, temperatures are, are less there. So the only way to do this is it to first to go to develop such technologies to go into the deeper waters, and the second, uh, the second part of which is uh, to go into really, really valorization of the seaweed, value addition. Uh, in, instead of uh, of uh, exporting uh, raw materials, we go into uh, value addition, making the seaweed products, scaling them up. And, and, uh, and selling for the benefit of the farmers and the country at large. Thank you, Flower. Um, let's turn to Professor Kim in South Korea, which is obviously in a very different uh, part of the market. It's already uh, got a highly developed seaweed production system. There's a big consumer market in South Korea, as we've heard. So, Professor Kim, let me ask you, what do you think the rest of the world can learn from the South Korean experience about how to leverage the full potential of seaweed? Uh, in short, seaweed aquaculture is good for the industry and for the environment and for the people. First, uh, I witnessed for the last 20 years that I studied these uh, researches, seaweed market uh, in Korea 
expand about five times and it grows 10% every year. When I studied this uh, aquaculture, the uh, Korea sold pyropia product to minimum, uh, at best 10 countries. But now uh, we are exporting this pyropia to 110 countries in the world. And sorry to interrupt, Professor Kim. Just tell us what is pyropia? Pyropia is red algae. Uh, maybe you are familiar with nori, uh, yep. nori shoot in Sushipa. Now we are exporting it to about 110 countries and market is over a billion dollars. It grew from nothing in 60 years, but it grows over 10% every year. Now we cannot meet the needs from the world. So the market grows fast and it is very helpful environment. For 60 years, we monitored the ecosystems, uh, environment in aquaculture farms. And we found that it sequesters seaweed, uh, it, it sequesters CO2 much better than trees in land. And second, it is very good way of bioremediation. Uh, the excessive nutrients from the river is observed in sea aquaculture farms. And if you see it, the, the eutrophication in uh, near shore is cured by seaweed aquaculture. And uh, this uh, cultivation bed serves as a shelter for small fishes. So uh, for five to six months, usually they put a net in the sea, uh, seashore and uh, the overfishing is not possible because they cannot access to the cultivation bed. So small fishes uh, can spend and grow. And when they uh, remove the net, then they start fishing again. So it's multi-use. So it's good in many ways, but it is confronting a challenge of global uh, climate change itself too because most of seaweed, uh, good seaweed grows in winter and water temperature is getting high, uh, warmer and warmer. So we need to develop new tribes, new varieties, which endure higher temperature. And now see, seaweed aquaculture doesn't put any chemicals in open sea, it's prohibited. So we don't use pesticide, we don't have herbicide, and it is very hard to maintain, uh, you know, parasites and all these pathogens. So we, we need a lot of researches to do. So in short, seaweed aquaculture is very profitable business and good to start uh, for, uh, we can recommend it because the market is growing fast. You've raised lots of interesting issues there, Professor, thank you. One of them is, is the potential conflict, I guess, between different uses of the water, seaweed versus fishing, perhaps versus leisure, versus trade from ports. Has the South Korean government been involved in managing some of those different uses and those different demands of the water? Oh, yeah. That is a good point, actually. That is what I wanted to talk. The countries who want to stop this seaweed cultivation need to consider these things very carefully because uh, there is no owner of the sea. The government, uh, so government role is very important to control the license of uh, how, to, how long you can cultivate the seaweed in the place and uh, it shouldn't have any problem with this uh, ledger things, uh, uh, fishing things. It is very complicated process. And if you plan it well, it's win-win for everybody because for leisure is used only during summertime and summertime there is no seaweed cultivation. And seaweed cultivation removes excessive nutrients coming from river and it cleans up the seashores. So actually it's helpful for the leisure uh, use. For the fishing, it pro uh, prohibits overfishing by fishermen. 
if it's uh, if the seashore is open, they will do it all year round. Then there will be no fish at all. But they have five to six months of time in the shelter. So this is something good roles of a seaweed cultivation. That's why, that's why this industry succeeded without uh, social problems. But one thing we need to uh, consider very carefully when you start seaweed aquaculture is water crosstalk. The water from inland affects a lot to seaweed aquaculture. It often brings pathogens and it brings too much polluted nutrients and then seaweed farm suffers. And then seaweed aquaculture, seaweed product cannot be sold directly like vegetables. You have to process them. You have to dry them. You have to make it good product. I mean, process them. And you need fresh waters to do that. So always when you start the seaweed aquaculture industry, you should have to consider uh, fresh water resources around it. So this is uh, what he experienced so far. That's, that's very useful. Thank you, Professor. Let's turn to uh, Anushka in Connecticut, um, obviously part of uh, the world's biggest economy, the, the United States. Uh, Anushka, tell us what's the current state of the seaweed business in the US and to what extent are, are safety considerations shaping its, its development? Hi, Barney, and, and thank you for having me and hello to everyone. Um, so the seaweed, uh, so seaweed is an emerging crop as well as industry in the United States. So we're very much at the beginning. Um, we've been cultivating it now in some states um, for about 10 to 15 years. Um, so there are 12 states that are either commercially cultivating seaweeds or investigating the cultivation of seaweeds for various uses. Um, but really primarily most of the cultivation are still small scale family owned businesses. Um, so we don't have huge farms here in the US. Um, the majority of our aquaculture production, marine aquaculture production is bivalve mollusk and shellfish. And in terms of safety, um, because we are exploring both food and non-food uses, the food uses of seaweeds is going to provide farmers with the highest value um, for their crops. And so therefore food safety of seaweeds is, has become a priority here in the US. Um, just going back to, to shellfish quickly, there's some states that are employing um, what they call the shellfish growing standards to some um, states or, or in some states um, to hold seaweed to the same standards. So what they're trying to do is to ensure that, you know, if, if the waters are appropriate for growing bivalve musk and shellfish, rationale says that, you know, those are probably the best growing conditions in terms of food safety for seaweeds. And that may change as we get generate more data and more research being done. Um, so that's one way states are employing um, food safety measures um, to ensure that the seaweed we're producing here in the US is safe for human consumption. Also our federal agency, the Food and Drug Administration considers seaweed as a raw agricultural commodity. So right away that sort of sets states on the, on the path to developing food safety guidance to ensure that the seaweeds being produced in the United States, according to you know, even different various states um, or in various states are meeting food safety standards uh, in general. So again, we're still um, you know, in the early stages, um, but there's really a lot of interest, not just with farmers, but with the regulatory agencies coming to the table, wanting to determine how we can make seaweed aquaculture and seaweed products economically viable in the US. Great, thank you. We're getting some good questions coming in already. Um, one of them is on safety, actually, Anushka. Um, one member of the audience is asking that um, people are saying seaweed is safe, but some species of interest have high inorganic arsenic. Um, how do we address this? So just to frame that slightly differently, you've said there are safety questions. Are these grounded in evidence of reason to be concerned, or are they more about a lack of knowledge about whether there are safety issues or not? Mostly lack of knowledge. And there are a lot of, um, again, our research projects out there. You know, in Connecticut, we've done some basic um, food safety testing of our seaweeds um, to develop guidance for Connecticut um, seaweed producers. 
In the state of Alaska, which is a huge surface area, not a lot of, it's not an urbanized state, like say Connecticut is, they may not have those same concerns. And so I think it's important to then focus on the science, generate as much data as possible. There are food safety concerns, but are they you know, perceived or are they actual? And I think that we do need to take the time to be responsible in evaluating whether or not hazards are a concern. In our, in our initial discussion with Vincent, he mentioned iodine and the fact that I think there's much lower tolerance of, of iodine uh, under US regulations than there is in some parts of East Asia. What's your perspective on that? Oh, I'm not a food scientist. So again, I, I'm going to turn that over to or, you know, let um, my colleagues at the um, FDA uh, make that determination. But um, not all species contain iodine. Our sugar kelp, our saccharina latissima, does contain um, um, higher levels of iodine compared to some of the other species that we cultivate. So I think it's going to be species dependent. Okay, well, we'll, we'll come back to that subject. But thank you, Anushka. Let's go finally to Professor Tsai at the Food and Agriculture Organization. Hello, um, Professor. You're, you're doing work on, on the science behind this and regulations. Tell us, what do you think an appropriate regulatory environment for the seaweed industry would look like? Thank you, Bali. I think it's a kind of difficult question. I think different countries uh, may have uh, different priorities. Um, let me follow what uh, Anuska just uh, talked about is the food safety. I think uh, it's quite important. Uh, for me, if we want to have a, some kind of a general, general kind of a principle on uh, regulatory environments, I think number one for seaweed it should be protective. So they should protect the human health. Uh, the food safety issue is in 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 the EU and Europe. They now pay more attention to the heavy metal contamination of seaweed because of uh, they see the trend of uh, increasing consumption in EU. And uh, well, this heavy metal happened to many people, uh, many food like food juice, uh, rice, and so on. But uh, seaweed, you are a novel food. So you uh, is uh, under uh, scrutiny, and uh, also you need regulation to do that. Also, uh, you need regulation for the environmental uh, protection. Well, um, you always say that uh, farming seaweed is very healthy, is good for the environment, and so on. But uh, let me tell you, as an agriculture officer at the UN uh, FAO, I can tell you that. Uh, if you uh, agriculture reach certain scale, you interfere with uh, the environment. Um, even by kind of uh, absorb all the sunlight, you may create some kind of environment impact to even the small creature like plantum. So we need to understand those uh, uh, effects as well. And also, of course, um, you bring in uh, new species that could cause some kind of biodiversity issue and also disease. If you kind of farm too intensively, stress the nature and then other disease. And so need regulations, need good practices and so on. And then uh, last but not the least is occupational safety. Uh, since Flower has already uh, talked quite a bit, so I will just highlight this issue. I think the second principle I can think of is that uh, the regulation need to be enabling. It is a new, uh, new thing. Uh, well, people have interest because looking to the future, it's an uh, alternative for food resources that can help humankind. Well, you never know. So uh, the regulatory uh, environment should be enabling. By enabling, I don't mean that we should lower the standard. I mean that the, uh, we should be uh, more holistic considering this food. Um, you know, um, not only for seaweed, but for agriculture as a whole sometimes because it's a new uh, activity sometimes the regulation tends to be very stringent. You look at the uh, the negative impacts more closely. Uh, the potential uh, positive impacts sometimes they they may put a less uh, emphasis. So the safe CV correlation we can uh, join together, trying to kind of uh, provide more uh, information, let people understand this industry. Um, I don't expect that the, uh, the, the authorities will give uh, uh, easy uh, to see me development just because you tell them it's healthy, it's uh, good for the environment. So I think uh, important of enabling is that you reduce the risk 
uh, you have to have some kind of regulation that make people understand that you don't change it so easily. The safety guidelines, you yeah, you collect evidence, you de you debate, and after you establish it, you don't change it easily. And uh, you do the zoning, you do the planning. So uh, I, I invest money trying to do my CV, develop my market, and then you don't change, you don't build a hotel nearby. To, so I think this is uh, what I uh, call enabling. So you reduce the risk for entrepreneurs to invest, and then you uh, use, and then also, uh, I hope they can use some tax as subsidy to, to facilitate the development of the industry. For example, uh, uh, if you establish the uh, food safety uh, for the uh, seaweed, uh, you can have some kind of uh, uh, public uh, procurement kind of uh, things to uh, increase the uh, seaweed consumption. So the uh, second kind of, uh, uh, the third principle I think of is flexible. You know, uh, some countries, they have a very uh, uh, articulated uh, regulations, how many lines you can put in the ocean, uh, the distance between each lines and so on. But some countries, they use a community-based uh, kind of uh, management. It also works like Indonesia. So because of, uh, so whatever works, also market-based uh, 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 mechanisms like a certification and so on. So we need flexibility. Not that we just thinking that the regulations are the only thing that matters. To me, uh, Many times, a lot of uh, market-based and community-based mechanisms are, are quite effective. Uh, and last but not least, uh, we need the scientific evidence based. So uh, as uh, you just mentioned about the uh, food, security, uh, food safety issue, uh, I think the ketamine and, and mercury uh, kind of uh, uh, contents people are concerned. So uh, when you don't have evidence, you not enough knowledge, you tend to be uh, more cautious. You tend to be uh, say that okay, they, they set them a, a very low kind of uh, uh, limitation. So you, you can say that it is uh, unfair to uh, to the uh, novel food like seaweed, but uh, it is what it is. So uh, we, what, what we can do is we just have to uh, have a lot of uh, evidence, and also we need evidence about environmental impacts. Uh, we also need evidence. People may not realize the importance. We need to know about the socioeconomic contribution. So that we can uh, understand, let the policymakers when they make their policies, they can understand. Well, this is uh, has a lot of uh, 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 not the percentage in GDP, but the employment, like, uh, how many uh, households are benefits, and so on. So all these things are quite important, uh, in my opinion. Thank you. Yes, lots of lots of important things there. Let me ask about just just one of them. You talked about different countries having different regulations on offshore activity. One of our questioners, uh, one audience member is asking, how can we get the marine licensing organizations mobilized to help rapidly scale up seaweed farming? Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, I think uh, you need to be specific for certain countries uh, because uh, offshore, like, well, uh, there's a certain jurisdiction that uh, need to be considered. Um, well, seaweed, yes, they uh, tend to use a uh, uh, lot of uh, uh, space. Um, well, it depends how you define offshore. So usually if you go too far from the soil, it, it's very strong kind of uh, wave. It's good for uh, some seaweed, but uh, sometimes it's difficult to operate for harvest and so on. So, so far, uh, my understanding is mostly uh, for those kind of industry use for consumption, there's still the near short. And sometimes even you can see they put the stick on the bottom. For the further offshore, I think maybe large scale uh, uh, planting for, for some ecosystem like a carbon sink or also for, for something. So uh, my short answer to you is it depends on the countries. You know, they need to understand the uh, interaction with uh, navigation, with, uh, with other things. So for environmental, I don't see much of a problem, but uh, well, depends, thank you. Great, thank you, thank you very much. Um, Philippe, let me let me come back to you on some of these safety questions that have been raised. We had the question about uh, mercury, Dr. Tsai mentioned uh, cadmium, sorry, question about arsenic, Dr. Tsai mentioned cadmium and mercury. Give us your perspective, Philippe, on, on these safety questions. Have we got Philippe? Still muted. So, sorry, sorry for that um, technical problem. Uh, so, uh, yeah, 
this is a, a very important question uh, that uh, probably many questions are, are raising, and uh, they will be part of a roundtable we will organize soon because uh, um, probably several roundtables will be organized about uh, the potential uh, uh, contaminants which could accumulate in, uh, in seaweeds, especially uh, the heavy metals, uh, cadmium, mercury, and also the, the specific case of arsenic. And uh, mm -hmm. that will be. Um, uh, the, the, the purpose of many activities. Uh, and uh, in Europe, we have the, the experience of many uh, national projects. We have already investigated some of uh, these aspects. What we have to stress first is that um, for some point, uh, especially when we are uh, considering cadmium, there is no much uh, cadmium uh, accumulating in seaweeds that it is in other vegetables. So, uh, and when you are eating potatoes, you are also facing uh, uh, the, the consumption of cadmium and and, uh, and sometimes the regulation is uh, um, stronger for for seaweeds than it is for other products. So that's uh, uh, that will be also an important point of harmonization and how to, 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 it could be uh, adopted uh, without risk. So that's a point. And secondly, the the point is that uh, not all seaweeds are equal when uh, they are uh, in terms of accumulation of uh, different metals, and especially in terms of arsenic. Uh, uh, the, the, the arsenic concern is uh, mainly for a few uh, born seaweed species which are already on the market. Uh, it could be for the genus Sargassum. It's uh, the Iziki, which is uh, consumed, uh, highly, highly consumed in, in Japan, uh, and uh, with other names also in South Korea, with uh, the toad. And, um, but uh, with uh, some uh, species of the genus Laminaria, uh, but not all, um, most of the, the, the red and green seaweeds which are consumed are not accumulating uh, a lot of arsenic. The second, uh, another point for arsenic is also that uh, it is uh, accumulated as organic arsenic, so it is in a form which is non-toxic. It is non-toxic for, 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 the, for the algae themselves, of course, uh, but when it is also consumed, it will not be transformed uh, um, depending on the, 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 the digestion on, on um, mineral arsenic, which is the form of toxic arsenic. So that means Many uh, scientific studies are av available for um, and which are um, which provide assumption about the risk of consuming the seaweed which have uh, accumulated some uh, arsenic. But uh, the matter for for the for, for, for the regulation is uh, to rely on very good analytical uh, techniques and uh, and, uh, and uh, one of the concerns of some uh, producers and, uh, and processors in, in Europe. Uh, uh, we were discussing this uh, recently, is the fact that depending on uh, the genetic or, uh, analytical laboratory will address your, your samples, you may get different uh, values. And so it's very important to uh, standardize the, 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 the methods, and also to have intercalibration with, between different labs, and also to, to, dis to, 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 to have some very good reference material for that. And reference material could be shared uh, internationally. So the, there is a few uh, reference material at the moment for seaweeds. We have to increase the reference material in which we, we will be able to, uh, to, 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 to attest the, 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 the quality of the, the, the measurements uh, in seaweeds. That will be very important to provide confidence uh, in terms of uh, food safety based on some heavy metals. Thank you, Philippe. Yes, confidence building is going to be vital, of course. Um, Anushka, I'd like to come to you on a different question, which is what people in the business world call demand creation. Even if the world increases its supply of seaweed massively, it doesn't matter if no one wants to eat it. Um, so one of our questioners is asking, how do we get the behavioral change we need uh, among non-Asian consumers to actually drive more seaweed consumption? Yes, that's a great question. Here in America, we love our burgers and our chicken. And, um, you know, even though our USDA, U.S. Um, uh, Department of Agriculture recommends that we consume two servings of seafood, a variety of seafood a week. I know I myself don't definitely reach that goal every week. Um, so it's going to be a long term process. Behavior change is, is something that doesn't happen overnight. Um, it could take generations. Um, but really what a lot of um, our seafood producers are doing, those that are cultivating seaweed, they have another job. So either they are producing shellfish by uh, oysters and clams, or they're lobstermen and lobster women. And so they're looking at seaweed as a way to diversify their income. 
Um, and so, or just diversify um, the products that they're producing on, on the plot of, of underwater land that they're working on. Um, and so really it's social media that a lot of our seaweed farmers are employing. Um, they are talking to their customers. They're talking to the dealers that they sell to. They're talking to their neighbors and saying, you can buy my oysters, but guess what? I have kelp and why don't you try it? It's highly nutritious. Um, it's um, an extractive form of aquaculture. Well, maybe they don't say that, but, but they, they tell the nutritional benefits, the ecosystem services that seaweed provides. And they provide samples, they do um, presentations, um, they work with local restaurants. And so it's, it's, it's a slow going process. But here in this country, it's just trying to get people to try something new. I know I'm a mom of two small children. So trying to get, introduce new vegetables to them. Um, it's, it, it's just consistency. And I think a lot of our kelp farmers are really, really innovative in the way that they're messaging and branding themselves and also making seaweed accessible to the average American consumer. And that's really the key. You're absolutely right that behavioral change like that can take generations, but I guess we should remember that big consumer goods companies like Kraft or Nestle, Danone, are masters of making us want things we never knew we needed. So uh, perhaps there's a role for them. With that in mind, let me come back to you, Professor Kim in, in South Korea. To what extent has big business been involved in creating or uh, developing the market for seaweed in, in South Korea? Well, actually you can find uh, nori uh, snacks in Starbucks. So it's like once uh, you open the market, market grows automatically. For, uh, I have a good example. Uh, in Thailand, they never consumed nori at all. But five years ago, some businessmen started to make uh, nori snacks. And then it beca they become one of the biggest buyer of pyropia product from Korea. And in Thailand market, there's $100 million uh, size of market opened in less than five years. And now they are exporting their uh, pyropia snacks to US and other countries too. So it's like if you uh, uh, have some chance to have a good experience with seaweed snacks or seaweed uh, products, then the market is expanding. So uh, usually the business, uh, big companies in Korea is trying to use, uh, give more exposure, exposure to the seaweed product for uh, other countries. But what we have problem right now is there is too much demand from the market and we cannot provide enough from our own cultivation. So we try to encourage other countries to produce their own product of pyropia or other uh, laminaria and other things. Once market grows bigger, then uh, we will have more chance to develop other different processed you know, end product. So, now that is what the big companies in Korea is trying to do right now. First, exposure this product more to uh, people, then they will find it anyway. Uh, we have to, we don't have to persuade them because if they have good product, taste good, then they keep asking us to sell it. And uh, we need good partners in overseas uh, to help us to grow this market. I, I think, for example, European countries uh, in France, they grow Undaria uh, at a certain point a long time ago, but never really make uh, industrialized because they think seaweed cultivation as farming. I have to say this seaweed cultivation is not farming, it's industry. You need processing and you have the marketing and you need to have good governance to control the license 
and all these problems with complex with existing business in the space. Uh, so this is what it need. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kim. Um, Flower, let me come to you on this subject of consumption. Have you seen any successful examples of people being persuaded to eat seaweed for the first time? Uh, thank you, Bani. Yeah. Um, I have a very uh, good example of the seaweed cluster. When, when uh, I started the seaweed cluster in 2006, uh, and I was talking about, about eating seaweed, actually, no one understood me. They were like, they were thinking that, well, how can this happen? So uh, we started in one village to make uh, some salad, to make, you know, all kinds of food stuff. And then uh, we continued with the second village, third village. So uh, now the villagers started to, to look for us to, 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 to teach them how to make uh, different uh, food products. And the, uh, another strategy that we, use, we used is that we have uh, started to hold a, a seaweed day for, for, the, for the cluster every 23rd July since 2016. And this year, actually, the, the Global Seaweed Star will also show some, some, some results there. So with this seaweed day, we actually make the seaweed food on the, on the site, in the, in, in the, um, in the uh, playgrounds where everyone can come and eat seaweed. So slowly, people have now started making seaweed food in their homes. So slowly, it, is, it has been 10 years since 2006 and 2010 uh, where many people know about it. But slowly, they, everyone is, uh, many people now in the farm, in their homes, they make seaweed products and, they, and they, some hotels also are now actually making a, a little bit of seaweed products. Uh, they have them in their menu. Can you, can you give us some examples of, of the kind of seaweed products people are eating? Uh, because in Tanzania, we are farming the, the red seaweed. Uh, so people are mostly eating, uh, they have uh, the seaweed salad, they have the, they make seaweed juice out of the juice, and the, they, they, they also make uh, cookies, cakes, they add into, into those kind of products. Okay, great. Um, let's go to Juning at the Food and Agriculture Organization. Juning, what's your perspective on, on how to make people want to eat more seaweed? Thank you. I think that's quite important. You know, uh, normally in the West, people think the seaweed is just a health food, but I think it's a misperception. It, it can be a very tasty food. If you understand the, the so-called MSG, it's uh, originally actually extracted from uh, kelp. So, you know, it means like a taste enhancer. It means they must be tasty. The key is that how you prepare it. You know, um, if you just eat it, you can maybe just like, taste like a piece of paper uh, with some ocean taste. But if you kind of uh, prepare it together with something with a certain uh, a sauce, uh, uh, like wrap it with rice, even my son who does not eat vegetables is eating it. But that's my uh, things, uh, personal perspective. But the, uh, from a policy perspective, I think we need the uh, public intervention. We always think that the market development belongs to the domain of the uh, uh, private business. Uh, yes, in most of the case, but the problem is in this case is a chicken and eggs because without the market, the how business wants to do these things. So I think the public sector need to have vision. If they, of course, they need a lot of uh, uh, evidence to support that this is a really healthy food, uh, a safe food. Uh, if that's established, there should be some public program. It can be a, a, some kind of a, a public food program in the uh, institution like hospital, uh, school, meal, and so on. I think that's not only help uh, increase the demand, but also can uh, build the, uh, the eating habits. Uh, I, if we work together, I don't think it takes uh, generations. You know, now with the internet, with the social media, you create a, a, a trend. Eating seaweed is healthy and it's uh, also uh, uh, tasty, then I think you may have a revolution eventually. Thank you. Sounds like there's an opportunity here to produce a seaweed recipe book. Um, we'll leave that to the coalition. 
Uh, Philippe, let me come back to you. We've got a couple of questions about um, non-food uses of seaweed, or at least not food for humans. Uh, one question is asking, what about its use to create biopackaging? Another is asking about using it as animal feed. Um, how important are those opportunities, Philippe? Yeah, the Vernet is, uh, there is uh, important opportunities. And uh, during the last four years, I was coordinating a project uh, called, a uh, European project called Genial, in which we were investigating the potential of uh, uh, developing biorefineries for so seaweed. And I think it is a very important concept for the development of the seaweed industry worldwide, uh, including for the tropical uh, red seaweed, which are mainly used for, for providing ingredients, uh, jellyfying agents. There is may, uh, a lot of uh, very uh, interesting compounds, uh, including, of course, proteins, but also a lot of fibers which are remaining after the extraction of some, some ingredients. It's also the case in the industry of uh, the biostimulant worldwide, uh, biostimulant for agriculture, which is um, uh, leading to the um, to the production of a lot of byproducts. And uh, so these byproducts are really uh, a source of uh, material for providing uh, biodegradable plastics. They could also uh, provide some uh, fibers which could be used in other type of, uh, uh, for, for construction for, for di different aspects, depending on the quality of the material, of course, and, and the, the opportunities. So that's a, a, a very important sector so will, that will develop in the, the, in the coming years. And uh, we will have uh, an integration of different uh, companies or Possibly also some companies who will diversify the, the market so they will uh, they will reach from uh, the, the processing of seaweeds. So um, that will uh, change a lot the industry, which was mainly based on the, the production of a, a single products uh, in, uh, at the beginning, especially in Western countries. Um, so the, um, we have uh, an example at the moment of a project developing in, in Africa, in Namibia, which is completely new from uh, on what is, was developed in Eastern Africa because it's now the cultivation of uh, large uh, brown kelp, so the giant kelp uh, growing in the, the upwelling of uh, the, the, rich, the, the nutrient rich uh, waters of uh, Namibia. And this project is really willing to develop a, a new industry uh, in Namibia, uh, providing first a biostimulant, which will be used by the, 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 the agriculture. Uh, in Africa, but worldwide, uh, but also a, a lot of products, uh, including uh, what you, you, you were mentioning, the materials uh, like biodegradable plastics. Thank you, Philippe. And, and let me stick with you and change the subject to climate change. Obviously, climate change is getting huge attention from governments, corporations, and citizens these days. Um, seaweed is, is relevant in two ways. We heard from Flower how actually the increasing temperature of oceans is harming production. And, and we've heard from you and others about seaweed's potential as a carbon sequestration device. How do you go about inserting seaweed into this broader debate on combating climate change? Uh, the, we will organize uh, um, working groups uh, within the coalition. And uh, we, 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 in our auditory board, we, we will have uh, Professor Carlos Duarte, which is uh, actively working at the moment with the Foundation Ocean 2050, uh, which is uh, precisely aiming to restore the productivity in the ocean and uh, contribute to develop um, uh, the, the potential of the ocean to sequester uh, CO2. Uh, so, uh, of course, uh, by um, uh, protecting mangroves and all other uh, marine forest, but also the, 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 the seaweed forest. And uh, there, there is a large uh, study uh, at the moment, which is uh, investigating the potential of uh, seaweed farming to uh, capture carbons and uh, how it, uh, the, the sediments uh, uh, below the, 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 seaweed, the seaweed farms have accumulated uh, some uh, uh, organic matter and sequestering carbons for, for for, for, for in the sediment. So the, 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 this study is very important. So, and it is a, an important um, uh, aspect of uh, the, the potential uh, of demonstrating the potential of uh, seaweed cultivation in the future to, 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 to remediate to the to climate change and to contribute to sequester more carbons. And that um, will uh, be very important. And uh, that, um, uh, but we need, demonstration site for, for that also. So uh, of course you, we have the the, 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 um, the the farms which are already operating, but the new farms like the Namibia farm I was mentioning is aiming at uh, um, to develop a, 
large areas of cultivation, uh, which uh, will sequester uh, very efficiently carbons, and and that uh, will represent a capture of carbon which is uh, comparable with the, the emission of a, a country like the Netherlands. So that means it's very significant uh, potential for carbon sequestration, and of course uh, the fate of this uh, the, the carbon will be uh, should be very well managed. It could be, of course. Uh, uh, we can envision to, to, to sing a part of the, the biomass in, in, in deep waters, but also um, 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 processing seaweeds and providing some uh, products which uh, will sequester carbon for, for long term will be also an important point. And I, I think it's a combination of uh, the environmental interest of uh, the, the seaweeds, but also the economic interest. Thank you, Philippe. I mean, that, that example from Namibia is fascinating. To cultivate seaweed on that scale, on a scale that can make a, a meaningful contribution to carbon sequestration, does it cause trouble with the other uses of those waters, whether it's fishing or, or industrial uses? Uh, uh, at the moment, there's, there's, um, in fact, uh, the, 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 this is occurring in, a, in, a, in an ecosystem which is the Bengala current, which is, uh, in fact, uh, the um, a place where there were big changes uh, uh, during the recent years. There were some uh, overfishing activities uh, which have led to a, a switch in the ecosystems and now there is less and less fishes, fin fishes, and there is more and more jellyfishes uh, occurring in these ecosystems. So the, 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 the challenge of, of, of all this uh, operation in, uh, in, uh, in Namibia is also to, to bring uh, um, uh, new change for the ecosystems by introducing this large uh, artificial forest of kelps which will uh, restore some biodiversity. So they, 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 of course the, 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 the seaweed will be cultivated for years because they, they will cultivate giant kelps and it will provide uh, habitats for uh, small fishes or larger fishes, uh, but also a lot of invertebrates. And the, the, the purpose of this project is also to demonstrate that we can reconstitute uh, on ecosystems in, the, the, in this area and that will provide uh, some hope for the future to recover from a situation which is uh, degrading during the recent years. Okay, thank you, Philippe. Um, Flower, let, let's come back to you. You mentioned climate change earlier. What, what climate change related projects have you seen in, in Tanzania? Uh, thank you again, Bani. Uh, for, for Tanzania, uh, we currently have a project called Global Seaweed Star that is, uh, uh, is funded by UK. And this actually has uh, stemmed from uh, a, a previous uh, policy brief we wrote in 2016 uh, of seaweed aquaculture. So from, from this, we, we went into uh, starting this project, a uh, global seaweed star. So actually, uh, to safeguard the future of the seaweed aquaculture through the global seaweed star, it means to, to look for ways of uh, working uh, to, to reduce uh, to cope with, with climate change. So what we are doing in, in this uh, project is uh, we are looking at uh, what can be done in the farms, what are biosecurity issues, for example, that can, the farmers can use to, to, to produce, uh, uh, to combat seaweed, uh, climate change and, and produce more sea, seaweed. We are looking at what are the seaweed diseases and the causes of seaweed diseases. We are looking about how can we have good seed? How can we uh, utilize uh, native, uh, native se uh, seaweed species uh, in, in these specific countries. And we are in Tanzania, uh, Philippines, and, and Malaysia. So it, it is uh, this uh, uh, results of this kind of projects that can be actually uh, help uh, the, the seaweed industry to cope with the effects of climate change. And actually, uh, I am employed under this, uh, this project at the University of Dar es Salaam. So we are working to, to, to have this kind of results, which we feel they are very good uh, against climate change. Great, thank you for that flower. And I think that's gonna be our final contribution today. We're just about out of time. It's been a, a fascinating discussion. So I'd like to thank you, our panelists, the members of the uh, Safe Seaweed Coalition Steering Committee. Uh, thanks to the Lloyd's Register Foundation for hosting this event. Um, if you'd like to look at it again, uh, the webinar is gonna be available to view uh, on demand for one month from today at seaweedrevolution.live. Dot ft .com, so do come back to it. I think what's clear is that seaweed is at the beginning of a long 
journey here, along an interesting journey that's no doubt going to have lots of twists and turns. I mean, we've heard about it, how it relates to so much safety questions, uh, government licensing, employment opportunities, the role of big corporations, the need for investments. So there's going to be a lot to follow, and I hope that in the future we'll be able to come back and look at where that journey's got to. But with that from the Financial Times, I'll say goodbye.